Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Sarah Spiekermann and I am an author and academic at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And um, let me tell you the story of why I'm actually here. Yeah. In 2014, as an academic, I started to do something that is not coming here. Aha. In 2014, I started the venture to say, I want to write about ethical AI and ethical IT innovation. And I started a blog called The Ethical Machine. And I was here at Repu Republica and showed the vision. And um, of course, since the term innovation is there, I thought, I must absolutely see what the top thinkers in Silicon Valley tell us about innovation and what it looks like. For me, it looked a little bit like on the slide here, like typical people like you and me and what it means for them and what kind of AR and AI they might use in the future. So um, I started out this very, uh, as a very like, realistic person and then I watched fig um, movies and YouTube by Ray Kurzweil. Who, who watched movies and YouTube figures on Ray Kurzweil, perhaps some of you? He's a really visionary thinker in Silicon Valley and he's a Google product director and everything. And I was very positive in starting this book. And then I read and I read and I read and I came across very strange citations. I came across um, things like you see here on screen, I will just read a few for you if you can't see it. If we have the option of destroying the brain, uh, we are scanning dr at dramatically higher resolution. Oh, I thought option of destroying the brain, I really don't want to be the platform on which that is going to be tested out. And I'm, I moved on and then there were sentences like, a more as a, at, although artificial hearts are beginning to be feasible replacements, a more effective um, approach will be to get rid of the heart altogether. Wow. <laughs> hey, man, this is a Google director, you know. He's a very big visionary. He's on YouTube all over the place. And I was like, how can you actually write something like that? I'm also an author, but, you know, I mean, pulling out the heart, then we will have eliminated the heart by 2030. Mm, he has to be very quick. Um, so why are we giving these examples? I, I just couldn't believe that somebody who writes things like that is actually allowed to speak in public. And then I moved on and I searched through the web and I was interested. I mean, Ray Kurzweil wasn't on my textbook agenda at that point, but I thought there must be people out there who really want to build a nice and good and interesting digital world. You know, you're here because you're interested in technology in a positive way, yeah? And what I saw is, of course, interesting websites like telling things like elevating the human condition and so on. And I'm coming from, you know, doing IT innovation in an open, privacy-friendly, safe, robust, uh, non-biased. This is, you know, my world. But what I saw there in elevating the human condition was mostly AI. It was nanotechnology and gene engineering. And I went to the core website of this group that I now actually know that Ray Kurzweil has co-founded, and it's called Transhumanism. And I went to their core website, which is the Humanity Plus website, and um, I looked at what they're writing. Um, and you see here things like, I mean, the, this I took from their site, like human intelligence is like a suboptimal information processor in the brain. Mankind's position in the world, we are an outdated version, we must be enhanced. Human vulnerability is not important, you know, the brain, we're just wetware. Um, Earth is an insignificant speck. The idea of well-being, well, give us more choices and then we are happy. Um, I, I, I was stunned, I must say. And I ask you guys, coming here to my talk, 
check it out. Check it out. Then I, uh, since I was, you know, seeing and I'm coming to that in a moment that this group is not just a few crazy guys. I asked some Google people, how can you know employ somebody like Core Records when I said, you know, in Google we have many opinions and so on, and that opinion also has its place. So, a few years, um, two years ago, I started a small, what we call the Homo Deus Harari project. And um, Homo Deus is the best-selling book by Yuval Harari, who is probably the most famous author of our time globally in shaping and putting to paper what seems to be the common notion of progress, today's progress. And, um, but before I show you the analysis of what we did is I asked my research team to say, please have a look at transhumanism and tell me a little bit more from a scientific perspective what it is. And um, my team, PhD, master students, and so on, they went out there and did a lot of research on literature, and they said, we can nail down transhumanism with four categories. There is more than four, but here are the four major ones. So the first one is, as I slightly introduced, um, a reductive view of humans. Um, what does it mean, a reductive view of humans? It means, for example, humans are just algorithms, biochemical algorithms, data networks. Um, intui intuition and emotional intelligence are not reliable. They are typically flawed. You know, we are subjectively unpredictable. Biology can be re replicated. The human body is a container that nourishes the brain. And this is basically what's typically repeated. The second dimension is, at the same time, an aggrandized perspective on technology. I'm an information systems scholar, so I'm coming from computer science background, and I read all those developments always with a small dose of criticism, yeah? because I know also the challenges in our backends and in our machines. But here is the aggrandized view of technology. So machines are predictable. Oh, we would love that. And therefore, better than humans. And technology is, of course, godlike, superhuman magic. And soon we will have a new machine species. Third dimension, transhumanism, with what I just showed you briefly, is inevitable. The human species will be replaced. AI will achieve human-like capabilities. There is an inevitable evolutionary step in front of us, and there is an imperative for progress. So when you, when you hear these people speaking, they will never say something like, oh, perhaps such and such machine could be built, or perhaps we may do these things, but they will always say, the future, it will be like that. I'm, <laughs> I've had arguments 10 years ago with people who said, in three years, we will have autonomous cars. And I told them, hey man, I don't think so. And now we're 10 years later, and there's nothing like that. Or 2030, we will have gotten rid of our hearts. So, but then, let's just, just watch this little word, will. It will happen, and I don't think so, because the future and what's happening in our future, we can never know. It's all fortune-telling to say things will be like that, because as we all know in these days, is that the future is happening to us, and it's unfortunately sometimes happening to us at surprise, and we don't know exactly what's coming. So, will is certainly the wrong word. And then the fourth dimension, and that's a dangerous one, because there's always also this notion of enhancement imperative, which is you have to do it, you know, you have to enhance yourself, you have to enhance your children, you have to genetically engineer your children, because otherwise, you will not, they are not, you know, they'll be disadvantaged, and things like that. 
So these are the four dimensions that we found out that may represent quite well what transhumanism is all about. And if you see this, when I look at that, I'm really wondering, are we seeing progress here? I mean, why are you coming to this conference? Because you want to participate probably in a good progressive future. This is why here on the y-axis, I'm noting down the human and social value creation, well-being, eudaimonia. We want to create something good with our technology, and we don't want to create dystopia. And you see, still, like, between 2014, when all of this started for me, it was a surprise, and, like, two years ago, I was like, okay, you know, like a little bit like the Google people who talked to me and said, there are many opinions in the world, so, you know, the transhumanists have their perspective and I have mine, and you have yours, you know, so I, I wasn't really concerned. But then I started to see, wow, <laughs> this is a pretty, pretty strong movement, so they're building up meetups and universities all over the place, and by now it's really you're, you're a cool person if you go from Harvard or Stanford right to the Singularity University, and then you get your startup well-funded afterwards. So you see here the Singularity chapters that are existing worldwide, um, and um, also we see pretty strange developments all over the place in the sense of I mean, we're looking to China for surveillance capitalism, but we also have surveillance capitalism, as Susanna Zuboff noted, already here and now with the data management platforms. We have people like Elon Musk who say, let's put the chips in the brain, Neuralink, not destroying it, he doesn't say that, but you know, this kind of technology. You have Peter Thiel building Palantir. You have even a guy called is um, Zoltan Istvan, who runs for presidency and who has written the book on transhumanism. So, um, yeah, this movement gets pretty strong. And for this reason, I am, as an activist, having been here with the Republica people for 20 years, I'm watching and I'm a little bit concerned. And I'm not the only one being concerned, because if you have a look and you Google here Timnit Gebru, Timnit Gebru was the researcher who got fired two years ago from Google because she was criticizing this kind of chat GPT technology that every one of you has probably tried out in these past months, the transformer technology, and she wrote a paper which I think, you know, academically, it's totally fine a stochastic parrot, she called it, and then Google kind of fired her just because she'd been critical about that technology, and she founded a think tank, and in February, like a month ago or two months ago, she gave this talk, it's called Eugenics and the Promise of Utopia Through General Artificial Intelligence, and I can really, really recommend to you to watch her talk. Now, I could still say, Wow, okay, you know many people in the world, and let's not care so much. But the problem is that what has happened is that we have developed a kind of culture. There is something like a transhumanistic climate, and I see that when I work with my students on something that is my mission. It's called by now value-based engineering. In the past seven years, together with IEEE, we developed an, um, a standard, an ISO standard, an IEEE standard, for building ethical machines, for making sure that a technology like GPT or so, or the biometric systems could be good, trustworthy, robust, privacy-friendly, and so on. But every time that I try to go and present it, and we did case studies, and we really have a lot of people behind ourselves, like IEEE having 420,000 engineers as members, so it's not small. But every time I talk to people about this positive future, it's like, 
oh, it's, bo it's boring. <laughs> it's, um, as Simon Weil would say, you know, the, the, the evil is always so interesting, you know, and, and the good, though, unfortunately, it's only good when you feel it, when you, when you find it, when you live it. But in telling value-based engineering, it's almost impossible. In this transhumanistic cultural climate, thinking a positive vision in which technology serves in a realistic way a vulnerable but magic and superbly intelligent humanity has become almost impossible. So either machine capability is totally exaggerated or as is written in Homo Deus, human beings are underestimated and portrayed as computer systems who overcome their animal status with computer systems. Um, let me give you an example. So when we do value-based engineering, we, do, we elicit the values surrounding a technology. And then we try to see what values could be harmed, which one could be fostered, and how can we then derive system requirements from those values. And it's a very nice activity to engage in, but then <laughs> I go there, let's, uh, I had an example where we discussed with stakeholders biometric toys a biometric teddy bear, you know, that could speak to children and so on. And um, then I am asking the stakeholders, so what values do you think could be coming about such biometric tools? And what they're selling me is things like, oh, that's very nice that the teddy bear can now speak. It can educate the children. And it can educate the children much better than the parents because it's neutral. And um, the teddy bear is also more intelligent than the parents. And it's probably also better than, and you know, more empathetic than the parents. And I'm like, okay, the digital teddy bear is going to replace the parents. Um, or um, I'm reading this, uh, this age journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Science um, article by Kuczynski. Um, who's also behind the Cambridge Analytica stuff a little bit, and he writes a big article where he writes, um, AI is better than judging your personality than your mother. And then he's giving lots of proof, and if you look at the statistics uh, from an academic perspective, you're really surprised. It's published in an A journal, but here we are, you know. Um, AIs are better than our parents and teddy bears as well. And now some of you might, have, might say and feel, uh, yeah, but perhaps that's true. Perhaps that's true. And sounds reasonable, so this is my question. Welcome. Welcome. You are already in that bubble. Even I am a little bit in that bubble. And Harari is a very clever man. He says this himself. We have always appreciated the power of stories and, imagine, and images to manipulate our minds and to create illusions. It's interesting that, unfortunately, two of my slides are missing in the presentation. <laughs> unfortunately, the big ones. The big ones are from scholars who are really, really, really good at what they're talking about. They're not historians. They are computer scientists. They are philosophers and theologians. They are neurologists. They have written 20, 30 books, and what are they saying about this vision that many of us are in? It's gibberish. It's an illusion. It's not true. <laughs> Why is it not true? Many, many reasons for that. Um, one thing is, 
Humans cannot be computers, starting with there is no hardware and software. It's not that our body is a hardware and then our brain is a software. While we are, every day, 40% of the synapses on our neurons are, cha are changing, 40%. We are highly plastic in how we are. Have you ever seen a computer, a software that configures its hardware at the same time, changing the hardware? No. That's one example. Another one is the majority of what we think is self-generated. It's coming from nothing. That's the majority of our brain processes. Another point. Where do you think the data is in you? Where is it? There's no data in us. We are processes of biochemical reactions from one moment to the next with our brain being fully embodied and nourishing itself and reacting as a full holistic system that isn't even local, but for e-cognition, the last 20 years of cognitive science have shown that humans are in the world, that their intelligence is not local, but extended. It is enacted. It is embodied. We are so far. Our intelligence is so far from computing. It couldn't be further away. Now, there are philosophical strings, there are ideas, of course, that we could perceive of information and meaning as information. Yes, we might use this term, but the term itself is nothing more than a model. If you try to capture any data, it's not possible. Also, because a data point, a bit, is in a moment, it's a static moment that might come as a string, but life is never in the moment. Life is moving on. If you send a dart, at what moment are you measuring it? Where are you as being in that flying flow? So there are a lot of arguments, and it's so sad that I didn't bring the big guy's citations that are actually in my presentation. Um, and. Um, here is what, uh, what we did, seen that obviously there is some misconception. I am surprised to go through our airports and stations and for five or six years, so surprisingly, this book Homo Deus by Harari is lying there, which has all these four dimensions of transhumanism in it. Actually, when I read it, for those guys of you who read it, it's a really easy read. It's nice. For a second, I was arguing with my husband, don't make this book so bad. It's actually quite, you know, a good read. But then I had my students check on it. I had this four men team and women team to look at the four transhumanistic dimensions. And what we did is we, I told them, take the book and take out all the passages that are on technology, AI, anything you know we as business informatics scholars could judge on a little bit. So that were 286 text passages. And then we had four people reading these text passages separate from each other, and they were looking at whether these transhumanistic stories would be in the book. And you see here on the slide, this first dimension, you remember that humans are, uh, that there is a reductive view on humans. We found 118 of these 268 passages that we coded. We saw 118 here saying, Humans and human-created institutions like governments and, 
and biological organisms are just algorithms, data processing systems or data networks. Humans and other biological organisms have deficits compared to machines. Human biology can be reverse engineered. Human created forms of government institutions or general society structures are suboptimal, like democracy. Human decisions are not based on free will. So you see here this reductive view of humans in 118 out of 268 statements. And um, so it's pretty there. Here is a quote, just one quote. From a dataist perspective, we may interpret the entire human species as a single data processing system with individual humans serving as its chips. Now, I would say, okay, I'm reading this book on the plane, and I want to be a little bit entertained, and I have this thing here, we maybe interpret the human species as a data processing machine. I say, okay, you do it once or twice, or you do it three times or four times in your book as a metaphor. It's okay, it's okay. You do it 118 times. Oof, that's get, getting pretty interesting, yeah? Um, and here are my slides actually, <laughs> obviously prepared really badly. So there, here was David Bentley Hart, an award-winning author of 19 books and 1,000 essays, including The Atlantis, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times. And he says, for example, this thing, I don't have so much time. We are really, are we really computers who suffer the illusion being conscious intentional agents? This is sheer gibberish. Professor Thomas Fuchs here, the author of the, of the book, The Ecology of the Brain, Karl Jaspers, Chair for Philosophical Foundations of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy in University of Heidelberg writes, brain is an organ which functions as one component of the whole organism and in which also no information in the information theoretical sense is stored or processed with algorithms. So you see, what I just tried to explain, it's not just little Sarah Speakerman <laughs> saying that, but one thing I know from an academic perspective is, as an academic, I must always challenge what I read. I must know where it's coming from, and I must try to get an overview of various perspectives around. And that's my responsibility as a teacher and as an author. And because I know, I know that this perspective is out there by people who are much more qualified than Harari, I would say, you know, the very, very least, the very, very least you must do as an author, if you put such claims out there, that you write things like, we may, and he does that a few times, but what we did with the students, we did the content analysis and we asked, how often do you write, we may, and not, we will, and it is like that. What we see, unfortunately, is that in 75% of his claims about technology, 268 claims about technology, 75% he is buying into the transhumanist future. 75%. He's not writing may or could, you know, and there's also one perspective. No. He presents our future to us in this terrible transhumanistic evil way without even questioning it without even writing may or could be or something like that in a responsible way, not to speak of the fact that all these great thinkers that are out there with different positions, he doesn't mention them. So then, the second dimension is um, the aggrandized view of technology. Again, 62 quotes on that thing. I don't have the time to read you so many of his quotes, but you see all the dimensions are there. And again, also here, 92%, you wouldn't question any of these superhuman, godlike technology thing, everything works. 
For this reason, we are doing now a film. We have created a movement. It's called Contesting Computer Anthropology. And we are in the middle of interviewing the big guys. And we have, for example, one of here, the author of the current affairs article, The Dangerous Populist Science of Yuval Noah Harari. And then there is one more thing which I don't want to miss out, which is the emotional attitude of the author. Now, you could say Harari is, Harari is a historian. He has no clue about technology. Yeah? So he's just looking from a far away, and he gets the impression through you know, the Google search and all those IT-influenced media selection processes that really transhumanism is the story. So he, he thinks that as a historian. What he could be doing is to say, this is really terrible, like me. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't expect that everybody thinks like me. But I would think an author with a responsibility, look at here how he thinks about this terrible future. 87% of his claims are neutral. Now you would say, neutral? That's perfect. Well, Hannah Arendt, in her book on Eichmann's trial, she showed something very interesting. Eichmann was also very neutral when he was on trial and he said, you know, I was living in a time the general consciousness was that Jews are bad people, so I didn't think about that. I bought into the notion of my time. I didn't question it. He was neutral. Now, I don't know whether we can believe that, but one thing is for sure. Hannah Arendt, in this book, said, if you're neutral, against something that is really doubtworthy. If you're neutral for somebody using human brains as a platform for scanning brains at more bigger resolution and you can take them out, if you're neutral towards that, he doesn't have claims like that, I must certainly say. But if you're neutral towards this evolution, hmm, you shouldn't be neutral. You should take a position. I invite you, if it's yeah. possible to finish it's like a thriller so nobody I'm, wants to stop but like i'm done <laughs> i have um, one final message we did one study and i'm not going to show you the pictures but we looked at who is actually believing in the story what kind of people what kind of people are buying into the transhumanist belief story only like 20% 80% of the German and Austrian representative public don't share in the beliefs. Those who do are often people who have complexes, they, they have social comparison complexes, they are unfortunately more male, I'm sorry, they are often younger, um, and they are often economists and lawyers rather than people who studied the humanities or medicine. And with this, thank you very much for giving me the extra minutes, and I hope you like my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, who is an economist and a lawyer here? No, it's a joke. So, unfortunately, we don't have really time or for the shortest question ever. If you have a very short question, maybe of five or six words, it works. One question. Or a question to you, are you, are you staying today? Is it allowed to yeah, come sure. to you and talk to you? Or? Absolutely, yeah, I so. can stay here a little mm. bit if there are people who want to ask questions. So is there one very urgent question? So can you please just run to the microphone as fast as you can? Yes, you do it, yeah, here? Or this one, yeah, you can take. But you, I keep it. Yeah. So, so my takeaway was, uh, despite the fact that you explained how, why people dislike this book. My concern was when, no, no, it's the, come the question. How do we conclude about Harari saying, this tool called AI is replacing the democratic processes? I think that's, this is annoying. That a machine overcomes my capabilities, I don't care. They do anyway. But when they overcome our society, that is a threat. How do you conclude about that? 
Thanks I, for the, uh, this uh, short question <laughs> and this question. I do Can think, you uh, um, shortly answer? In, in that respect, uh, he, is, um, he is, is very correct. I don't understand um, what, where he's coming from, but from my own perspective, I see the AI influencing and manipulating our thinking. It, AI already, first wave AI manipulated the, the democracy in the US, Trump and was, was Brexit, all of that was already AI generated filter bubbles. Yes, it's eroding already our democracies and it can get worse with deep fakes and all the transformer technologies now, which make it even easier to manipulate and put people into fake universes. So here I guess, yes, he is right and he's right to warn.